Thank you for coming. I'm Katie Franks with the City of Bellingham, and I wrote a grant a couple years ago to the state to fund a cultural heritage tourism strategic plan process. And we got a grant, and the state was very excited that we wanted to do this, because it's the first time anyone in the state has done it, a small community like ourselves. Um, so with the $15,000 that we got, we were able to hire Cheryl Hargrove, who is, we're so lucky to have her. Um, she's here tonight to give an overview presentation of what the project's going to involve and how you all can get um, involved and be part of this. So I just want to tell you a little bit about Cheryl. She is president of HTC Partners, it's consulting division of Hargrove International. Um, she has an emphasis in arts, culture, and heritage tourism, and has been involved with a diverse collection of clients over the last three decades. She utilizes her international network and broad in industry experience to offer clients added value and access. She's a recent contractor as an associate director uh, for the National Geographic Society's Center for Sustainable Destinations. Cheryl's perhaps best known as the first director of heritage tourism for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She developed the key steps and principles for sustainable tourism, focusing on history and culture, and produced the publication, Getting Started, How to Succeed in Heritage Tourism. Preserving the past, building the future. In partnership with the National Trust, she also helped develop content for a website, culturalheritagetourism.org, and she frequently speaks on cultural heritage tourism trends, development, and marketing strategies at state, national, and international conferences. She currently works, she's here visiting us from Georgia. She flew in last night and she's touring our city, and we are, like I said, we're so excited to have her, and I'm going to turn it over to her now. So please welcome Cheryl Hargrove. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. And I will tell you, you know, the old saying about Southerners having hospitality, well, I think you've got us beat. I have had a wonderful day today. And everybody has been very generous, not only with time, but also information. And part of why I'm here right now is to really better understand your community. And so in uh, light of my meetings, I thought it might be helpful just to really talk about what is cultural heritage tourism and also why it may be important or of interest to you. Um, obviously, I appreciate you coming out on a Wednesday night and braving um, the elements. Uh, I know that you had snow yesterday, so I was glad to not have that today. Um, but I wanted just to make sure that we're trying to be all on the same page. So as I go through this uh, presentation, if you have questions, we'll have plenty of time for conversation afterwards. And I look forward to meeting all of you and working with you on this process. So let's begin. Um, it really is important for me to tell you a little bit about cultural heritage tourism. As Katie mentioned, I've been involved in this for a long time. And in part, I came to um, cultural heritage tourism in two different ways. One is that I was working in the tourism industry and I was actually encouraged to uh, work internationally. And I realized that what people were asking for were things that we were not necessarily taking care of back here at home. It's the vestiges that make each community unique. It's the uh, elements that um, distinguish one community from every other and also the real uh, sense of pride that people have in their place that they work and live and play in that can be then shared with visitors. And so helping to make sure that that um, is something that could continue is how kind of cultural heritage tourism came to be. Um, it, it's important that I think we look at definitions. When I was at the National Trust, we. Um, really, and, and people have been involved in cultural heritage tourism since, um, well, for centuries. Um, anytime you're going to a different uh, destination or culture, you're engaging in uh, activities that are maybe different from your own. But in the U.S., um, our tourism industry really was not cataloging 
uh, visitation to historic sites until the 1980s. Um, the U.S. Travel Association, as it was then, was the Travel Industry Association of America, and they were recording outdoor activities such as going to national parks. They were uh, recording camping and more traditional kinds of tourism activities, but not necessarily visiting historic sites or um, engaging in cultural activities. And so helping to actually define this industry segment became important. And so we came up with this um, definition of traveling to experience the places and activities that authentically represent the stories and people of the past and present. And to making sure that it is that past and present um, so that it's not like you're just going in a time warp and only staying in one particular um, uh, uh, decade or century, but really making the past relevant to the present and that combination of who you are that makes um, this community so special. And I use community at large. Um, when I talk about a community, I look at um, Bellingham and Fairhaven and um, the tribal nation to look at this special place that you have here, not just um, from a uh, particular geographic standpoint or a political boundary, but more from what a visitor can experience. And so we do look at it from a historic, cultural, and natural as well as the intangible resources that are unique to the destination. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about this, but I think it's important for the purposes of this process. One of the first exercises that the planning committee talked about was, well, what is the right definition for us? And so the definition that was uh, developed for cultural heritage tourism for your destination is travel directed toward experience in the history, art, and culture of a place. And as you can see, culture is very um, broadly defined to include a lot of different kinds of activities and um, peoples and uh, places. Well, why do we care? Well, partly because there is a audience that is particularly interested in place-based activities and they are wanting to seek out those kinds of experiences that are distinctive, that are not necessarily manufactured theme parks. They really want to have the heart and soul of community. And so we look at this audience, and when I was at the National Trust, we didn't have a lot of, in the 1980s, we didn't have a lot of uh, research about them, and so some has been conducted, probably not enough, but we have some now studies that say these are people who do spend more because they stay longer. They're wanting to really get out and explore and understand how to um, best uh, experience your place. And they want to do something. They also want to meet you. I know that I have been enriched by having conversations with many of you today. And I've learned more about your community um, based on those conversations. I, I know why you have breweries and why you have theaters and why you have a lot of different kinds of activities and, and what you like to do. Those are things that help me understand a community better. And as a cultural heritage traveler, it means that we want to have that experience all through the process of the um, on-site activity. So I want to look at it from not only when I'm going to a, a museum or being in this wonderful theater, but I also want to make sure that I'm, I'm dining someplace local or going to the local uh, coffee shop that we went today or um, you know, being able to walk around and, and see the architecture of local buildings. So looking at all of those kinds of activities of where it can be a way to make sure that I'm having a full experience. As we'll go through, it's certainly um, un, not unsimilar to all other kinds of travelers. You know, online information is important. And it is really your uh, front door. The World Bank says that a website today is your embassy. And that's pretty true, I think, when you think about what is your first impression, that's what everyone first goes to, and how welcoming and informative is that. So as we go through this process, we're going to talk about how to reach the customers that you want to engage with. Now, the cultural heritage traveler is one that is typically older, more affluent, better educated. Um, baby boomers are still the dominant profile, but certainly Gen X and multi-generation 
um, cultural heritage travelers are on the rise, and families as well. So we look at some of these activities that people are interested, and it's more about going out and being able to make it relevant to them today. Education is a word that you will find a lot in the desired activity. They want to learn something. And I remember I was with a tour operator one time and says, you know, I, I work with a lot of families and especially for grandparents and grandchildren, the grandparents just want to know that they have something that they can talk about with their ch grandchildren over dinner. And you think about that, a shared experience that can happen is, is probably something that, you know, if you're going to a museum or something that you can do together is in something that will lead to those kinds of conversations. So having that kind of activity level that is going to attract and be something that uh, more can do is important. So what does a cultural heritage traveler like to do? Well, obviously visiting historic sites is very popular, but so are also visiting art museums, attending art craft fair or festival, um, dance, state and national parks, shopping in museum stores, or even exploring urban neighborhoods. I think one of the things that, if you take away nothing else, it is that a lot of times the general traveler takes on cultural heritage activities in such that they're going out and saying, you know, they're not today saying, gee, today I'm going to be a cultural heritage traveler. Instead, they're saying, I want to go to a destination that's going to afford me wonderful activities. And I may find it in a lot of different um, elements, but this is part of what I want to do. And as you can see here, that they may participate in an organized tour or focus on uh, shopping for local, locally made items. They may want to go to a farm or go to a farmer's market. And they may even want to look at um, participating in a historical reenactment. Another key, though, and when we talk about this, and especially for your community where there's so much adventure travel and nature-based activities, is remembering that these, the people that are currently coming um, may actually decide to, you know, expand their visit with a nighttime activity or an extra day's activity. Even though they may be coming for the adventure side, the availability of culture and heritage will help them perhaps stay longer or actually encourage them to come back. And that is an, also a key of where you're looking at a holistic approach to making sure that that visitor has a really uh, destination-rich experience. We have to be mindful, though, that uh, not all visitors are one-size-fits-all. Um, you know, we talk about baby boomers looking at historic sites and what scenic drives, but they're also um, more and more wanting other kinds of activities as well. Gen X and Y are into nightlife, but they also have a long list of things that they want to do during the day. All uh, groups want to experience local cuisine, you know, the foodie tours are um, certainly on the rise. Juno actually, I'm, has anybody been on the Juno um, foodie tour that they're offering now? Um, it's, it's a combination of a walking tour and a progressive food tour where you learn about the city's chefs and its culinary evolution. It was launched in 2015 and they do um, one of the really cool ones that I like is the Prohibition Progressive Party Tour which is a speakeasy-themed, multi-restaurant tasting experience exploring regional food and drink through historical lens. I could get into that. And think about just how somebody has bundled probably existing activities together, um, done a bit of research to understand the historical perspective, and been able then to bring it together in a way that a visitor could go and appreciate and add some extra time in a community. One of the other things, though, that is um, important for all of us is the fear of missing out, FOMO, and also YOLO. You only live once. And so we, you know, as we get um, individuals that are concerned with the fact that they want to make sure that, you know, time is a new currency. And so making sure that every experience really caters to helping them satisfy um, an experience that's worth their time. This happens to be a gentleman who's on an archaeological dig in um, helping out in Romania. And um, it's a guided uh, uh, oversight 
but it also provides an opportunity for him to explore um, his own culture. And um, so he's um, taking time to um, not only pay for this experience, but also to appreciate it. And, and as we see, this is kind of a hard uh, slide to read, but this was actually um, a study in destination anal um, and now destination analyst and you see that authenticity, you know, is very important to all generations. As is, and you look at cultural interests, is also interest. Um, and so looking at how to make sure that that always is prevalent in uh, the activities that are afforded is important. With you being on the border of Canada, you have realized certainly um, the impact of international visitation. But what we find is that international visitors do want uh, to experience American history and culture. It may be very different from their own, but they also want to make sure that they are seeing a part of um, our nation that they may have seen in the movies or they may have learned about in a book but this is a chance for them to, to see real America. And so helping to actually provide experiences for these visitors becomes important. I like this slide though, and just because it gives a chance to look at the fact that as Arthur Frommer, the guru of travel said, you know, it's really about retaining your soul. And that's what cultural heritage tourism, a strategic planning process, really focuses on is how to make sure that you are indeed um, making sure that you retain the sense of place that is important to you as residents, but also then looking at what you want to share with visitors. So to kind of give us a stage, I'd like to talk about four trends impacting cultural heritage tourism. And I am a um, a former journalist, so I have kind of, I'm a, I'm a little of a media junkie, but I'm also a research nerd. And every December I look with anticipation for the Future 100, which is um, from JWT Intelligence. And one of the things that is um, fascinating is that these are consumer trends. These are not necessarily travel trends or cultural trends or even, um, uh, American trends, but they are global consumer trends that we need to be aware of because media will be uh, championing them or uh, there will be consumer products that will be utilizing them or focusing on them and looking at how it may impact travel. So I'd like to just share a, 11 of them with you in a little uh, overview. The first is that, and, and you probably all can relate to this, is that it's experiences over goods. We have really moved away from a product-based um, environment to really making sure that you're investing in experiences. The millennials in particular are focusing on this and that it is very important to make sure that you are offering an experience worthy of um, the price and value. The second is about the attention economy. How many of you have a smartphone? How many of you check it at least once a day? Um, you know, it's just one of the challenges because we are bombarded with so many different um, messages and mediums today that really getting at your attention becomes a critical consideration. So having a way to make your destination be compelling to rise above the noise is very important. And so by focusing on your authentic assets, your history, your culture, your unique um, experiences is one way to do that. Because as we talked about today, it's not only about com competition with other destinations, it's competition with staying at home and, and uh, sitting in front of a laptop or a computer or some other way. So one of the things we must really look at is how we um, are positioning against everything else that's going on in this world. 
Um, civic data is just a way in, um, I think, as far as sharing information. Um, you've heard about big data, but civic data is now how cities are helping uh, to share information and make information more available to everyone so that we can make informed decisions and be able to also um, look at how to move forward. Wi-Fi disruptors unplugged. You know, the whole flip side of the attention economy is, is that there are some times when people just need to be away from your phone. And so there are destinations who are actually, or uh, resorts or activities that are saying, leave your cell phones behind or turn them off so that we can immerse you in the now and to really just be. And so to um, Bellingham's uh, marketing, it really goes to being and being present. Augmented reality does certainly uh, challenge us though with regards to the fact of that if somebody's going to go to um, enjoy Pokemon, you know, that they're still focused on maybe the game as opposed to where they are. And so helping to, you know, get people into uh, using technology but not necessarily letting technology take over the experience. The flip side, though, and you'll, you keep seeing a theme here with technology, is techuation. Um, and techucation is about using technology in ways that will engage students. Because especially digital natives have, joined, have grown up with um, use of technology. So, you know, it's embracing the fact that if they're using technology, how can it be used to help them learn more? Um, we've talked about millennials. We've talked about Gen X. Well, now we're going into Gen, Gen Z. The first of um, Gen Zs have just come of age, and now they are on the way to travel. So what really is defining Gen Zs, and how are hotels in particular uh, using technology to make sure that they're uh, going with the experience? Polar travel I highlighted just because um, your proximity and your weather to um, uh, the northern climes, this is where there are companies that are actually providing novel experiences in the wild. For instance, um, and it is tied to number nine with elemental hospitality, the Nolstern Hotel has an open air double bed in the Swiss Alps. Now, open air double bed in the Swiss Alps. <coughs> You're at 6,400 um, feet above sea level. $300 a night. There is, and, and if you need a blanket, they will provide it. I, I, yeah, I, well, at $300 a night, yes. Yeah, so I, you know, but I think that, uh, you know, that's, that, and now that's not going to be something for everyone. But the whole idea that people want to be in nature, they want to have it in a unique experience, is something um, that there are uh, people stepping out and doing um, extremely well. I know when I was at National Geographic, my boss actually stayed in a cave in Mexico, and they actually gave him a cot, and there was a fire um, outside the cave, and it got cold at night, um, and he would have paid $500 for that experience, it, but he was a journalist, so he, he got it for free. But, um, you know, these are the kinds of experiences, novelty. Now, I'm not encouraging novelty for novelty's sake, but the fact is that these are the kinds of offerings that people are looking at and are starting to market um, as a way to um, position themselves in the others. Um, DNA tourism is basically not only uh, looking at uh, genealogy, but also going further and even looking at reverse genealogy. So where people uh, move to as opposed to just going back to ancestral roots and looking at how that um, impacts um, uh, old world, new world, other kinds of uh, cultural movements. And Travel action is all about going and having um, travel with a purpose. And you know, the social uh, consciousness where more and more brands are embracing 
um, not only their policies, but also making it very transparent about what they stand for, that social good. There's some other trends that single ladies, Xers, who are the forgotten generation, political consumers, um, retail naturalism, you know, if you remember Apple stores that used to be very minimalist, well now they're going to much more um, to a community interactive situation. So the theme here is that if you're looking at experiences, it is how to bring people together as opposed to isolating them and bringing them together in a way that is authentic and um, really is appropriate. And I think we should also mention, though, that one of the things that's happening, too, is really looking at making sure we are not just about the visitor, but also about the resident, too, and making sure that you help dictate um, those experiences. Because it's also about happiness and is making a local connection. And, and, um, but if you're not happy, it would be difficult to sell that kind of connection. Um, I don't know whether you've ever been to a place. I have, unfortunately, where I'll ask a, a resident, so what, do you, what's, what is there to do here? Ah, there's nothing here. You know, that's not the kind of answer you want um, to have your residents. And most people that are going to walk down the street and ask for directions or ask for recommendations are not going to necessarily meet the mayor or city councilmen who are the great cheerleaders or even people in the tourism industry. They're going to meet regular residents. And so having that civic pride, having that engagement is important. And I've certainly experienced it today when everybody's been very engaged and, and um, innovated about where you live, work, and play and what you offer. But having that um, shared is important. And it's also that, you know, it continues that this is what people are looking for and making sure that um, we don't lose sight that it is people to people, um, you know, and, and buildings can talk, but it is also um, through that personal interaction that the really rich experience comes through. So looking at, um, it, you know, experiences, I think it is important as we say that, you know, people will pay for that experience. And it's also though that in this day and age with social media, that if they do not um, have a good experience, they will tell everyone. And so we want to make sure that that can be avoided at every cost if possible. It is also where um, sustainability is important and, you know, the environmental friendliness and, and making sure that, um, you know, we are uh, true to our um, planet as well as being true to the community is important. And I think we'll find this being more and more um, important as we go forward. Um, and when looking at even trends in how uh, disruptors like Airbnb are starting to really focus on how you can have a, what they call a social impact experience, which they, lost, they launched last year, um, is to where you actually pay to maybe have uh, lunch with a chef, but the funds go back to a food bank and so that you are contributing um, to a positive cause. And so that experience actually then can uh, weigh in with what you want uh, to support. So then we go to trend two, and I think that, you know, evergreen experiences are certainly important um, because when we talk about sustainability, and you, know, you have a, a season um, for outdoor activities, but businesses have to stay open year round. And so looking at how to make sure that you can have a opportunity that will allow for visitors to come in the shoulder season, in the off season, and to be able to really um, expand past just um, that high season. Um, and so looking at you know, the reasons why you would offer this, and cultural heritage bears up very well to it because a lot of it's indoors as well. Um, and if you've been working with Brand USA, which I know that um, the Bellingham CVB has done, is that they really focus on experience pillars that include both cultural, but if you notice that a lot of these are not necessarily just indoor activities, they're outdoor as well, but hoping that they provide that comprehensive view of a place.
this is, happens to be the Sandcastle Children's Museum in um, Ludington, Michigan, where two school teachers actually started a museum because as an outdoor recreation place, they didn't have any um, facility when it was in clement weather and anything for children to do. Um, and so they actually recreated a lot of their main attractions, such as uh, the local ferry, um, the ice cream store, uh, the local bank, and some other kinds of icons in the museum to help teach kids about their place, but also to help make it a fun experience when they couldn't go to the, um, to the uh, park. And so this happens to be on uh, one of their main streets, and it is a way, again, it's a very prominent uh, museum that has now turned into where uh, a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations and um, other uh, adult funk, uh, organizations will have their own uh, events just because it tells their own story. Um, this is the Floyd Country Store um, on the Blue Ridge Parkway in uh, Floyd, Virginia. And they actually are strategically located between Roanoke um, and uh, Richmond, Virginia. And they're on, so they get a lot of traveling um, artisans who are wanting to go and um, have a performance at a smaller venue and this is actually a country store during the day and um, cafe and then it is actually an entertainment center on Friday night and they've had Allison Krauss they've had um, Zach Brown they've had a number of other artists just because it is a, a spirited intimate um, gathering place and because it helps fill up their calendar so um, you know, location, 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 but this allows also for people that are traveling the um, Blue Ridge Parkway to have something to do in the evening, which is very important. We always think about daytime activities, but, you know, what can people do at night other than just being able to um, uh, dine and drink? Not bad things, by the way, but... Um, so looking at how we grow evergreen experiences, I think one of the things that you do very well are you're scheduling sensory experiences. You have walking tours, other kinds of activities, but then also making sure that you give people a reason to return. And that allows us to have people coming back over and over again as they want further and further enrichment and um, immersion. Trend three is looking at that sharing economy. And we see it certainly through Airbnb, and we also see it through uh, Uber and other kinds of um, sharing economy. But it is also about looking at things such as camp in, the, camp in my garden or couch surfing, um, uh, Wimdu, some of the ones that, you know, um, very, very unique ways of doing it. It's also about looking at Eat With. Has anybody experienced Eat With? Eat With is where you will actually sign up to go and have dinner in someone's home. And you actually um, go on and, and it will tell you that um, Joanne is cooking a traditional Vietnamese meal. And she will then cook you at $65. You actually can sign up. You then find out um, the location uh, the day before. And you get to see who other place, uh, who else may join you. So you get a profile of who will be dining. It will be up to six people. So it is a trend that's taking off in a lot of urban cities. And it's just, again, a way to have that kind of uh, gathering of um, people and that have the desire for a similar experience in, you know, um, in somebody's home. This is actually a people first tourism is um, a, I call it the dating website um, uh, where you are actually through a cell phone having access to an architect or a um, uh, archeologist or some other kind of expert to really facilitate a way to connect with them. So 
I'm coming to Bellingham, can I uh, have an architect take me around on a special tour? I'm particularly interested in X, Y, Z. And then uh, someone who is registered on the site um, is paired up for that. And so you are able to actually have that kind of one-on-one -on -one meeting space. These are some of the ways in which um, we are starting to see more and more immersive experiences that are specific to interest and also specific to destination. And so we see that it is really um, something I don't think is going to go away. I think we have to look at how it all fits into the traditional um, distribution systems, but also making sure that um, that others are not compromised by this. So looking at, for instance, Airbnb, as long as they're paying hotel motel tax, we're seeing that you know many destinations are fully supportive of it. But, but that trust economy, and when you have uh, millennials that are not interested necessarily in just booking with a big brand and wanting something that's very specific, this is a way in which that can be satisfied. And we talk about technology. Technology is something that I think we can't, um, you know, as much as uh, we use our technology, we have to understand of its impact. And certainly the cultural heritage traveler has been as immersed in using technology as anything else. And so, um, you know, all traditional social media certainly are important, but it's also about how to access information. And the cultural heritage traveler is the one who's going to make sure that they're booking through mobile devices, both smartphones and tablets. So, and this is the uh, State of the American Traveler last year even just supports all of that in talking about some of the uh, tools and techniques and what people use. How many of you went on a vacation last year? First off, thank you very much. We wouldn't have a travel industry if people didn't travel, so that's always a good sign. But it's also, what did you use to make your plans? Did you go online? Did you check social media? Did you look at crowdsource like TripAdvisor or other kinds of um, third-party reference tools to find out what people were saying about a place? Those are not surprising, then that will continue to grow. But looking at also um, making sure that you're then tracking how this works is important. And then there are the new technology options that are important to understand. We talked about augmented reality, but there's also the virtual reality, iPads, digital picture frame, holograms, robots, and touchscreen monitors. All of these are um, uh, significant to understanding uh, the role that they play in cultural heritage tourism. Um, if you've been to the uh, Abbe de Cluny, in, uh, right outside of Leon, uh, they are now using uh, computer generated modeling of what the original abbey looked like. And these are uh, computers that, uh, screens that turn 360 so that you can actually take it and then move it around and you can actually see where some of uh, the abbey, this is only, you know, only one sixth of it, exist today, but you can see it then through the eyes of what it used to be based on archaeological uh, information and historical documents. So these are the ways in which technology are also being used to interpret as well as to market. And when we look at um, how technology can also help us in making sure that the customer gets the view it's want, the Dallas Museum of Art did a study and I think what was really interesting is it helped them reshape some of their programming. I particularly like the fact um, of, you know, the fact that you can have, you know, observers that do want to use technology and how to use that, but you can also have others that are looking at um, independents that, that don't want to have uh, technology, don't need technology. They really are wanting to just go and review and, and see um, exhibits on their own. And so making sure that we are responding to what our visitors want is important. And also making sure that it's part of a story. And stories are um, very important for us when we're sharing information. So looking at how storytelling is not just about sharing it in one way, but make sure that it's engagement so that somebody is also being able to contribute 
to that story in their own way. Whether you like selfies or not, um, they are uh, rather uh, the trend. And I, so I think it's making sure that if, you know, where can you have someone take a selfie so that it can be um, shared with someone else and they can capture that kind of iconic experience that says, yes, I am here. It's not all rosy, though. Um, and in the time that we uh, went from uh, 1989 to 2015, the number of house uh, historic museums and other kinds of museums doubled, um, according to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. When that kind of capacity has grown, so is the amount of then you know options for people. We also have over 2,000 historic downtowns, according to Main Street. You know, a number of properties list on the National Register. So saying something's on the National Register is not necessarily, you know, the only thing that you can hang your hat on nowadays. So looking at how you can really um, set yourself up as unique is important. And it's still important just because of designation and the importance of a designation but it may not be the only thing that's going to attract someone. It may not be enough. And so looking at not only how then increased competition, when communities start to look all the same, even Main Streets, when the lamp post and the banners and the benches all look the same, even though you've you know, restored downtown, that is actually a conflict because People want your Main Street, your downtown, to look like you, not necessarily like one in Virginia. And so helping to make sure that um, you retain that sense of place and appropriateness through all elements is important. Um, so looking at what, what's right for you and that really needing to have that unique selling proposition. And then one that I think we're all uh, more cognizant of nowadays um, is looking at the pressure to balance um, visitation and resident desires, um, managing capacity and success. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Some of the other challenges are certainly commodification, um, funding, um, tired exhibits, you know, the need to either um, bring things up to a, a point of relevance or even making it easier for people to experience um, lack of diversity, um, not being able to necessarily be open as much as visitors want, and then looking at how also to engage and educate youth um, so that it is relevant to them. Those are the kinds of considerations that are important these days. Now, there are some good news, there are some opportunities that I think are important for us to look at. And that is that, you know, we have the opportunity not only to look at just physical buildings, but really look at it beyond bricks and mortar. And to say, you know, like the Fruit Loop Tour in um, Oregon, to talk about what brings everything together, you know, and how can it be then presented in an engaging and informative way that is place-based and place-keeping. It is also about making sure that we are talking about stories, that it's not just about when you're going to a historic house museum and looking at the decor, um, that you're pointing out all of the decorative objects and you know, talking about them, but instead talking about the family who lived there or the importance of that place and its context with that um, broader uh, destination and bringing it to life. You know, when I was, um, I actually didn't like um, history museums growing up because I thought they were boring. I also thought that the only thing I was learning were names and dates that didn't really relate to me in my life. Um, when I was in college, I had a great book called The Good Old Days. They were terrible. And I thought, you know, this for once finally helped me understand that it, most significant dates were a, a, something built up to that. So it was a backstory. It was the thing that helped me understand why that, that date was so important or why that event happened. And so you learned more about that uh, social conflict or that, that issue that was uh, resonating or bubbling up and you understood then why it was important and made a difference. So looking at that story and how to relate it is very important. This happens to be the Crooked Road in 
a uh, picture of it in um, Virginia, but the Cookard Road is also a place where it has a really rich uh, music history. And so over the 300 miles of this road, they talk about where you can go and hear the old fiddling convention, or you can go and hear um, Ralph Stanley, or go and hear some of the great bluegrass um, musicians that um, took their inspiration from the landscape. And then I think uh, something I'm, I'm particularly um, thrilled about is that there is a growth in educational tours. You know, certainly we have Rhodes Scholar, but we also have um, National Trust study tours. We have uh, the Sierra Club has educational tours. And more and more of them are including not only that um, uh, traditional group tour experience that's focused on education, but often will include a local lecturer or someone who's going to really put things in context so that you can experience that place and learn from someone firsthand. And the Educational Travel Conference, which just happened last week in St. Louis, had one of the largest delegations in National Geographic um, study tours is talking, yes, they're certainly going to take people to Cuba, but they're going to be doing more and more domestic tours, in part because not all of their members can take seven-day tours or 21-day tours. They want to take three- and four-day tours, and so they want to be able to still have that kind of branded, enriched experience, but just maybe on a more thematic basis or, sh or something that is not as lengthy a tour. So looking at those kinds of trends is important. Um, so what does this mean for y'all? Well, it really means that it's an opportunity to make sure you're focused on you and your unique um, uh, product and your experiences. But it also means that it takes planning, then it takes everyone coming together. And it means that you have to really decide what's important. And it's looking at how to then make sure that you are working together, but also mindful of your, the desired outcome and making sure you're measuring along the way to ensure you're realizing those opportunities. So that's where we talk about now in the planning process of moving forward. And so I'd like to talk to you about the five steps that will happen between now and August that will really help you as I think move forward in a holistic way that can um, be engaging in the process but also be informative as you move forward in um, offering visitor experiences. Um, the first is really the, the process we're in right now and that is looking at analyzing and, and um, identifying um, the potential and you have a lot. You've already, I mean, you've got tourism going on. So how is it that you're really able then to move the cultural heritage component forward? Well, part of it is, is looking at, you know, what really needs to be the emphasis. Um, but it's in also looking at, and after looking at that inventory, then how do you decide uh, what's ready and what maybe needs um, or is an opportunity for development? So. Uh, Bellingham and uh, the planning committee came up with asset categories. You saw earlier in the definition um, those three asset categories of arts, culture, and heritage. And these are some of the subcategories that are included. And you can see that this allows you then to start saying, well, what all do we have? And that's that first basis of making sure that you really have a good grasp of what's available and when it's open and what it offers and um, how it contributes to a broader story. So looking at um, the arts are defined as follows and um, we see that these are the things that are defined in the categories. Um, they continue on with the educational and maker arts as well as the culinary arts. Again, um, food is very important um, to our uh, experiences. But then looking at the cultural sites and certainly making sure that uh, as we look at cultural sites, centers, and events, that we also focus on what is sacred to you as a community that you perhaps don't want to share. And being mindful that then that needs to be articulated as well. 
and looking at how, uh, at what level um, elements are shared. So going in and making sure those categories are known. Uh, historic sites and activities, um, making sure that you again um, have all of these kind of cataloged for purpose. After looking at that inventory, which uh, the planning committee has done, that really looking then also at determining visitor readiness. And that's just exactly as it says, what's ready for visitor, what's open now, what's almost ready, or maybe it's open, but maybe it has limited hours, or maybe it needs to have some additional kinds of uh, interpretation or marketing or other kinds of elements. And then the third is really ideas or um, potential places that maybe aren't open or really haven't even been thought of or how they uh, are a story idea of looking at how it could be possibly um, developed and marketed for future uh, use. So after all of these elements, then there's the SWOT analysis, typically looking at both the internal and external. And from that then becomes the foundation for the second phase, which is where stakeholders are involved in planning and engaging in a process of um, setting forth goals and objectives. And it's really to cover some of the things of making sure everybody's on the same page as we talk about, but also making sure that you can overcome the last, making sure that you know what your outcomes are and you can actually plan for those uh, rather than ending up someplace that you don't wanna be. So it's a matter of making sure we engage stakeholders and there'll be an opportunity for all of you to weigh in on you know, what this plan should cover and what is a priority to you, to you. And I'll share a little bit more about that at the end of this presentation about how you can be involved in this process. But we wanna make sure that everybody um, understands their role and, and opportunity. And also recognizing that not everybody uh, may come to a meeting like this, so we will build a, a variety of forums so that people can share their voice and opinions. And we will look to all of you to help make sure that the right people are um, uh, asked and so that we have all of the um, constituents that, that need to be at the table represented. And, and looking at uh, not only uh, different tools, but making sure that this is a fun process. Um, I always talk about the fact that, you know, we're not doing brain surgery. We're talking about something that most people really enjoy, and that is visiting a different place, learning about a different place, and so stepping, putting ourselves in that visitor perspective and, and that mindset is something that we should all keep in um, the forefront of this planning process because it's really, yes, it is about what you want to share, but it's also about what your customer or your visitor is wanting to learn and how to um, understand them better and how information can help us um, go forward with that process. So the process is, is as follows. It does include the inventory and analysis, which will conclude this month. And then it'll also look at, you know, making sure that everybody's um, involved in the planning process, looking at also then um, additional market trends and, and what segments, you know, who, who is it that you want to have coming to Bellingham and Whatcom County? You know, who is important to you? Uh, during this process that maybe you're you're already getting or maybe somebody that that is new as an audience and how to attract that customer um, Looking at specific goals and outcomes as well as then Framing into the priorities of a strategic plan and what that represents and then figuring out um, You know, what are some things that can be done right away in year one that are going to be important to so that the plan moves um, into action and, and that is important, making sure that the development of authentic experiences is included so that it's not just about um, the planning aspect, but it's really about developing and hosting and making sure that you have that rich and robust um, activities available. Um, and I know that you're already working on some signage and some other kinds of um, activities, but it really is looking at those first impressions that I know Roger Brooks has talked about and making sure that every aspect of the experience is being covered um, so that, you know, from the time somebody comes in uh, to your destination to the time they leave, it's a really rich and, and um, engaging 
um, experience. And authenticity does matter, you know, and I think that if there's one thing that um, cultural heritage tourism focuses on that perhaps other industry segments are not is that you should be true to you. And that is not um, what you're, um, what you want to be and who you are. That's what will shine through. And that has to be, in, as I said, in every aspect of it, from the signage all the way through to shops and other places so that people can see exactly who um, you are. And, and that does include great host. One community I have um, uh, liked to talk about is Lucas, which is the grassroots art capital of the world. That's their self-titled, um, self-proclaimed um, destination. But this is a uh, population 300 in, in Kansas, and this is their uh, welcome sign. You kind of get a sense of what you're going to get when you go in. Well, and just to make sure that you really do get your sense, um, this is their bowl plaza, and it is their bathroom. Because they want to make sure that they just don't have any old bathroom. They are the grassroots art capital of the world, and so um, it is um, there. And, and they have, um, it, and all of this is done, as I said, with volunteers, and, but they take great pride in making sure that their experience carries through in every aspect of a visitor experience. Um, and, and that includes also in shopping and, and um, making sure that you can have those kinds of, um, you can go to Brant's Meat Market where they actually cure sausages and uh, they will actually give you um, sausages that you can take home. And uh, so, you know, making sure at every aspect you have those kinds of experiences. Um, historic and contemporary, which is also, I think, important. Um, and the, John Schofield, who's with the University of York Department of Archaeology and, and Director of the Cultural Heritage Management, works with places that, you know, get left out of design. And so he takes homeless people to go around and help um, find um, uh, heritage and actually um, gets them involved in the process of telling stories. But it is about creating uh, learning objectives, making sure that your visitors have emotional ob objectives and behavioral objectives really to help affect change and to make sure that it is a process where everyone can have some kind of call to action. And I think we want that from our visitors in particular. Because interpretation is about telling your story. It's about understanding visitors, um, designing relevant learning, and also making sure that it's the right message. Um, again, and not just names and dates, but all aspects of our heritage, and not being not shying away from more controversial. Um, you can tell by my accent and from where I am that I am from the South, and one of the challenges is certainly where we are um, dealing honestly with enslavement and looking at how to present stories that are not necessarily um, positive and not always from the white perspective, but making sure that um, our African American community is the one who is telling the story and being able to share uh, the messages that are important and, and uh, critical to them. So in looking at and the ad interpretation, and this is part of that planning process of making sure that your experiences are hitting on all cylinders is looking at, you know, really what you want your visitors to have as a takeaway. And to make sure that you are then um, building those kinds of uh, activities that are going to not only be relevant, but will really help them uh, change their life. Uh, the Tenement Museum, if you, anybody been to the Tenement Museum in New York, it's actually a story of immigration, and it uh, was initially about the 18th century. You re really get that sense of what um, new immigrants to the country deal with. The Tenement Museum in New York is now adding a new tenement house to talk about uh, Puerto Rican, Chinese, and Asian from the 1950s. So making it where there is not only just that you know, early settlement period, but moving forward to help tell newer stories as well. And I think that's where we're looking at how to help um, move that forward. 
Um, so when we look at these experiences, and I think it, it, it's important to think about your own visiting experiences, where you've gone, what have you done, and what have you learned, and what did you really like? What, what was interesting to you? So to make it where uh, people can embrace those kinds of activities um, and make sure that it, uh, again, is something that is going to um, be worth not only someone's time, but also maybe help with regards to um, um, investment. Um, and this is something I teach at the University of British Columbia, um, cultural tourism, and um, one of the things that one of my students brought to me uh, last spring was this project where David Foster Way will include interpretive signage and public art. And, you know, so I think, again, it's not always just about um, uh, the interpretation of dead people, but also of icons from today, and we certainly see that in film and other things. So what we find is that in a new business model that is looking at programming is what's important. Although hours are important, yes, but it's actually can you, if you can't be open um, on weekends or anything else, then perhaps shifting to where you can be available when visitors want to experience you because that becomes what's important. And then being able to also, uh, for a lot of house museums, is going ahead and selling pre-sale tickets so that they can actually make sure that they have the right staffing available. Looking even at making sure that um, you know social media posts are made so that people can actually really learn more about your story and be up to date. And telling that fuller story. I really like one of the things um, that uh, the Alexander Ramsey House in Minnesota is doing is history happy hours. And they find that the most interesting audience is not necessarily um, one they expected, but it is women business travelers because they feel safe going to uh, historic house museum at five o'clock rather than going to the bar at the hotel. They still want to go out and do something, but that becomes then an audience that um, they've been able to tap into. And most of them have been found through social media. So, you know, and then it's also about funding. And I, I add this just because Asheville was one of the first places to do a tourism development fund. And I know you have a um, percentage of your licensing tax going toward um, marketing, which I, I applaud you for making that kind of investment in helping um, smaller nonprofits achieve those kinds of outreach. But it's also with regards to some of the big capital projects. They've, uh, Asheville has actually done $22 million um, in, uh, since its inception, it's $14 million since its inception for a variety of projects. The condition is, is it needs to help though expand overnight visitation in shoulder and off season. So it's actually again going back to that whole evergreen approach where um, the condition is that yes, it has to be something that is not just going to um, be another festival during their busiest season. There needs to be something that's going to help expand that kind of offering. And they've done, um, you know, a variety of activities, including uh, restoration of their original farmer's market. Um, and it also looks at things like, you know, very creative ways of raising money, which is, you know, a farm-to-table dinner, for instance, on Main Street, um, where, you know, a farmer's market needing money, but having this long progressive dinner for 155 people brings certainly community, but it also became something that was really kind of um, uh, interesting for a lot of out-of-towners saying, oh, I want to be involved in that too, because I get to be involved in a, um, a very large community dinner. Um, so uh, after we talk about the fact of not just planning and then developing, but it's certainly marketing, and um, looking at all of those kinds of pieces and parts that make sense for cultural heritage tourism also makes sense in the traditional marketing arena. And so looking at how you can do things though that are um, you know, using market research to better understand. I know that um, you know, the museum uses uh, uh, visitor counts, which is from the American Association of State and Local History, and using tools that are really gonna help you understand your customer better is important and making sure that you can then target as opposed to saying, we want everybody. You know, being very mindful of who's going to be most appropriate. The Texas Historical Commission did this 
um, because they realized, for instance, that the Hispanic population was certainly growing in Texas, but um, throughout the Southwest and realized they did not have a lot of materials for that particular audience and wanted to make sure that, not, um, that someone could connect to their own uh, story and so developed this particular uh, travel guide for um, uh, the Hispanic uh, or heritage travelers that were interested in learning more about um, the Hispanic side of Texas. Um, and all of the influence makers um, who really made a difference in the development of the state and um, how that uh, could be related through programs and other kinds of activities. We also talk about, you know, I think that digital marketing, and especially for um, cultural heritage tourism, is important because that's, again, where you can make the story case and you can really engage people. And, and certainly, when we look at um, Google's five stages of travel, that's where people who are wanting to have involvement, they do then want to be able to share their information. So making sure that you can hit them on all channels is important. Um, I know that uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, was very concerned that they were losing the Amish. And if you've ever seen a Lancaster, how many of you have been to Lancaster? Well, you know, always on the front cover of the travel brochure was this very bucolic um, landscape with the horse and buggy. But, you know, US 30 is very different from that. It's very congested. It's very um, overdeveloped. Um, it has a lot of... Uh, uh, inauthentic um, uh, Amish uh, claiming uh, attractions and so there was a real uh, tension between the Amish, uh, the local residents and visitors who really weren't understanding about the destination so they put forth what they called um, a heritage partners um, graphic style and actually did a decal that you see here to help people know what was authentic Amish, what was authentic heritage, so that the customer uh, who was visiting that wanted that experience could kind of peel away um, the manufactured uh, process and attraction to really get to the heart of what was true. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, ways in which we can do things, and, and I think uh, I share this just because, again, how to make sure that marketing can help you satisfy your goals. The British Museum um, partnered up with uh, Radio 4, and if you've been to the British Museum, oh my goodness, it's overwhelming. I mean, they have so many, you can spend weeks there and not see everything. And they recognized that, that people were intimidated by that experience. And so they said, how can we help people you know, find this um, experience in a, in a better way. And so they, they decided to select 100 objects that told the story of the history of the world. But they did it in 25 pieces each quarter. And so you had to go there four times in order to be able to get your 100 um, uh, pieces and get the full history of the world. And they weren't always the most one well known. So you had, it was almost like a scavenger hunt to go and find these different places. And so you moved through the museum. And they said it was really, they found more and more families. They found people who maybe had never felt about going to the museum, going and enjoying. So these were the kinds of um, activities where marketing and um, uh, messaging can come together. Um, in the Blackstone River Valley of Rhode Island, they do a program called Creative Blackstone where they don't ever introduce any kind of uh, tour or activity or any kind of program or without actually giving it to residents first. And so residents are encouraged to um, give it a trial run, almost to do a test drive. And so it's a marketing strategy that then they have great word of mouth because local residents have gone and said, oh, yeah, I've been on that. Let me tell you how wonderful it is. And so they become that great um, ambassador for a particular program. Um, and, and fifth, we talk about management. And management, tourism management from a perspective of not only um, once you've developed and, and you're marketing, but it's really about hosting and maintaining your integrity of place. 
Um, we talk about it not only from a perspective of place making, but also place keeping and making sure that it is indeed, um, you know, an opportunity to, to ensure your essence is retained. And looking at it from a, a global perspective, the Global uh, Sustainable Tourism Council, which is an organization, nonprofit organization, has actually even put together destination criteria that they feel every community that should embrace. 37 of the criteria of um, 54 are actually um, related to cultural and heritage in some way. And as you look at it, you know, it, I mean, this stuff makes sense. It's not, again, it's not something that is um, uh, too lofty, but it is just something that maybe we need to be reminded of in a great way. Because uh, as much as a proponent of tourism as I am, I do recognize that it can overwhelm places and it can actually um, sometimes maybe get out of balance and it can be a tipping point. Um, I uh, live uh, not far from Savannah, Georgia and uh, Charleston and Savannah have tourism management plans just so that they make sure that they can retain um, what everyone finds attractive of those particular destinations. Um, and looking at how to make sure that it doesn't get out of balance and what needs to happen um, to make sure that happens. And so making sure that, you know, what policies need to be in place, but also who needs to be at the table to make that happen. Um, this happens to be a, a article that just as you see um, happened last week where Barcelona's new mayor is actually putting a limit on tourism growth and saying you know that they want to make sure that they're not over capacity they need to make sure that they are being able to ensure residents can still enjoy a sense of place so looking at how to understand tourism management is important not only for um, protecting the resources um, that may be fragile but also making sure that you are good stewards um, for future generations. And so looking at how to um, uh, build this in in a proactive way so that you're not then faced with a tension of um, where the tourist that is coming or the visitor that is coming to your community is not necessarily one who's respecting what you have. And so when we look at it, it's important to measure the impact of cultural heritage tourism on all of these fronts. And I think one of the things that's certainly significant for me is that when I went to National Geographic is, you know, the resident piece. It, it needs to make sure that tourism is, con you know, contributing to not only the uh, economic and social impact, but it also is making sure that it is contributing to the well-being of residents. And so how all of that fits together is important. Um, this uh, is from a small community that is um, of a population 2,000 in southwest Georgia on the other side of the state where I live. And they actually had a lot of uh, black-white tension, um, high unemployment, and they decided that they needed to do something. And so they actually decided on a community play based on oral histories. And if you've been to Chautauqua, New York, they actually happened to... Um, go there and they met a producer who came down and helped them write a play about their community and it's all volunteer led and it was not only a way for them to embrace who they are but it also started some of the racial healing and so that became an, a, an important consideration for them on a, on a going forward basis to make sure that you know uh, tourism continued to foster that kind of um, uh, compares uh, the compatibility. So when we talk about a process, um, you know, my job is to work with you through August, but I will tell you that your job will never be finished. And that's kind of actually a, a, a wonderful thing because you have the opportunity to continually review and assess and also then to make for make um, decisions as a go forward basis. I look at when I started in cultural heritage tourism 20 years ago, it's very different than it is today 
in part because the tourist is very different than today. And technology has impacted that. But it also helps us as far as looking at um, making sure that that's a dynamic process that you can then move forward on in a consistent way. So, and as we have new players and partners that come to the table, even new residents that come in um, and making sure that they are educated about what your offerings are. So I leave you with um, what I consider the five principles of cultural heritage tourism because these really for us um, in uh, planning perspectives are kind of guiding principles that we focus on from all perspectives. Certainly looking at authenticity and quality. That becomes, you know, uh, whatever we do, we want to do it well. We want to make sure that it's real. But we also want to make sure that we're preserving and protecting what's important. And because without that, you know, we really are, you know, killing the goose that lays the golden egg. But more importantly, we're losing our soul. And so the preservation and protection um, ensures that we're good stewards, not just for now, but for future generations. Making sites and programs come alive really is about making sure that we are connecting and we're making sure that we are uh, being relevant in our presentations so that we're going to have something, uh, sharing something that others will want, but also that's true to us. And then that balancing act, which is so important to make sure that if there are places that you don't want to share, then you're not then um, sending people to that place, but instead um, providing opportunities for them to learn that ex uh, story or something somewhere else. And then it's all about all of you working together because none of us can um, be uh, the person who is leading it in isolation. It needs to, to break down those silos and really to be a collaborative effort that uh, crosses borders, crosses generations, and moves forward in a positive way. So my information is here. Um, and I look forward to, you know, working with each and every one of you. If um, I've got my business cards as well, I'm glad to share those. But I also encourage you to um, meet the planning group, which, of course, um, includes uh, Katie Franks with the City of Bellingham and Annette in the back with um, the Whatcom, uh, Bellingham Whatcom County Tourism Convention Visitors Bureau. Um, and... Alice here with the Downtown Bellingham Partnership, and Steve with the Historic Fairhaven Association. Those are the ones that I've been working with so far, um, and really who uh, I'd like to tip my hat to for coming up with what I think is a great definition. Also, um, the categories that helped us build that itinerary and that inventory. And then we look at having an advisory group um, who is represented here just to help us understand, you know, how everything starts to fit together. And so I encourage you to uh, contact Katie if you'd like more information on this process. And I certainly thank you for sitting through this um, presentation on a Wednesday night, and I'm separating you from dinner. So at this time, I'll just say thank you very much for your hospitality today, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future.